Hello guys. That's a video, another video on uh, uh, basic radio theory and tube theory and uh, just electronics theory uh, with really no math involved. Um, but today we're going to talk about, well, you can kind of consider some history of radio as well as main thing is what I'm looking at is uh, the tuning of a radio. Um, how it changed from the very earliest radios to today and why those changes were made and uh, go on a little discussion about that we start out with in the very early days was this circuit here this is just your basic crystal radio circuit uh, a lot of kids build these back in the day this was the main radio Excuse me. And basically, all you've got is a, a a basic tank circuit, pastor and coil. Uh, you might consider this inductive tune in, in in regard because the tuning is done by a slider across the coil, effectively changing the length of the coil, or the number of turns, which then allows it to tune, changes the uh, inductance. This in, in, is fed off of a tap into a crystal diode and then out to headphones. In the early days it was great, it worked fine. Um, when there wasn't very many radio stations, uh, they were few and far in between. They were relatively weak and it was difficult to sometimes pick any of them up. You had to be reasonably close where the um, atmospheric conditions had to be just right. Uh, there's virtually no application here so in essence only way you're going to hear anything is with headphones. Some of the big problems is uh, first of all the tap off of here to feed into the crystal is the crystal is a fairly low resistance unit but one of the big problems is it actually creates a pretty heavy load for the coil which in turn actually reduces the Q of the tank circuit and when you reduce Q you broaden out the band pass make it extremely wide so these were not very selective um, you could actually tune over quite a range in, in kil uh, several hundred kilocycles and still pick up a single radio station. It'd still come in. So if you had a couple radio stations that were within a hundred so kilocycles to each other, you would actually pick both of them up. So selectivity is terrible. Sensitivity is not that grand means you don't have any amplifier at all. Uh, the other problem with them was since the selectivity, you know, the band pass is extremely wide, there's uh, noise was considerable. Anything out there uh, that could create radio uh, RF noise, RF energy, uh, doorbell, electric doorbell or anything, electric motors, any type of sparking or anything, these things would pick it up extremely well. Now, one improvement that was made on it was to go to capacitive tuning such as this and put a tube in. This is a grid leak detector tube. When the triode tube started coming out in the market, a lot of uh, early experimenters and amateurs started using the tubes as detectors and which it, you had high impedance input here so that actually helped out with the cue and narrowed up the bandwidth some plus you get a little amplification here so you actually increase its sensitivity but still it was fairly uh, broadband and still had quite a few problems that this one had uh, 
with the selectivity and still somewhat low in sensitivity. So the next step was the invention of the regenerative radio and if you really notice this circuit very very familiar to the uh, um, particular coil oscillator and it's it's similar in a lot of ways uh, you have a regenerative coil up here or a tickler coil that's hooked into the plate just like the tickler coil oscillator a tank circuit here that you tune you, it's grid leak detection and consequently one of the big problems with these was that when you adjusted this what you actually were doing when you adjusted the tickler coil you adjust it in so that you get the strongest signal well just beyond the strongest signal is self oscillation so it was a very touchy area there and these things could jump into oscillation for just virtually any reason just even bumping the you know bumping the radio like that could actually throw them into oscillation so uh, any any changes in your batteries or if you were running some other type of power supply any changes in voltage to the plate could cause it to go in oscillation once you got it set. Um, vibrations, signal strength, variances, any number of things. But basically the way it operates is you got another tune circuit, tank circuit, you tune the radio station in with a tuning capacitor. But what the uh, what you did here is you adjusted the coil so you give it feedback. By giving it feedback it actually uh, would increase the strength of the signal by upwards to almost a hundred fold over the uh, crystal detection or crystal radio so you got uh, an increase in select or in sensitivity they were better on selectivity because they were getting better about making these uh, tank circuits and the coils and winding them a little tighter and, and increasing the Q on them to uh, improve on uh, the band pass to narrow it up. So they, they were definitely a sight better and much better than the early, uh, whether it was the crystal or the, regen or the uh, tubed type uh, detector radios. Another thing that was a lot of times done with these, they would go ahead and add in um, later a couple more amplifiers after the detector for audio amplification. And they was able to get them up to sometimes be able to operate the early horn speakers. Uh, otherwise, basically, it still was set with uh, headphones, still a personal radio. So what's the next step well the next step was to take this one step further and that was to basically tune an RF amplifier and here's a block diagram of the TRF radio or tune radio frequency generally it'd be like uh, should put in the other line here um, you'd have a lot of times most of them were about three RF sections, sometimes four RF sections. Each one was a tank circuit and an RF amplifier uh, that they used in here and uh, to tune each one of these RF amps. So, you know, just one gave you some gain, the next one give you more gain, and the next one even more gain. So you'd end up with uh, quite a bit of gain. The other unique feature of doing this is when you've got tuned circuits like this, each time that you send one tuned RF, the uh, output of it into the next one that is also tuned. And what I mean by tuned, they have a tank circuit just like this, or like this one here. It's usually on the grid circuit as opposed to the plate circuit. Uh, when they send it into the next one, it would actually multiply uh, 
the band pass and narrow it up even more. Um, again, doing it here, you would even narrow it up even more so that you ended up with pretty decent selectivity and this much application you could end up with pretty good sensitivity. Send it into detector and then uh, audio frequency amplifiers and you could actually now have a radio that could easily um, play a, a run a speaker and these got pretty sophisticated uh, they could have like I say up to four RF tuned stages but a lot of them got to the point where they were using push-pull audio outputs um, audio amplifier tubes and stuff and they were you know uh, driving 10 12 inch speakers so they were pretty good little radios. Um, most of you have seen some of these radios. I'll see if I can rotate this around and pick up one on the screen I've got here. And see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. But this is Atwater Kent 40. And basically um, they couple the plate to the grid this is your tuning condenser and here's your tank circuit right here so the grids are tuned the plates have just got a RF primary coil in them but these are your three RF tuned circuits and amplifier circuits then goes into the detector and then these two transformers interstage audio transformers feeds of out of the detector feeds the first AF and then into the second AF and then right here where number two is, one and two is goes out to the speaker and you hook your speaker there now come back to this some of the problems with these were was that they had a real bad habit uh, they could get some pretty good gain on them and they had a real bad habit that the output could actually back feed into the input and in other words get feedback in here and get all kinds of interference and harmonics and a bunch of problems this way that would really mess them up in, in their operation the other thing is too you're you're running a tube amplifier over a wide range of frequencies in RF. These were triode tubes. The internal capacitance in the tube between like the cathode and the grid and the, and the grid to the plate and the cathode to plate these start showing up real good in RF frequencies so the gain could actually drop off pretty good um, over the the range of frequencies is you especially going into the upper frequencies on the broadcast band the other problem is due to that capacitance and due to the problems with uh, uh, having to really badly you know had to really strongly shield these and even at broadcast sometimes that would give trouble still with some feedback by the time you try pushing this into either more gain so you can pick up weaker signals or if you try using it on shortwave, much higher frequencies, they just wouldn't work. Uh, they, it wouldn't be practical. It, it could be done, but the cost of the radio would be extremely high due to all the elaborate shielding that had to be done and everything for it to even operate. So that's where we come up with the super heterodyne radio here. Another block diagram of it is to make improvements on this. The idea was is how to, we need the amplification, but how do we do that, say, at a, it would work best at a fixed frequency. And in order to do that, then you, you need to be able to tune the radio, but yet have amplification on a fixed frequency. And the way that's done is your superheterodyne. You set up a local oscillator in the radio, tap it into a mixer, bring in your antenna into that mixer, your signal, 
mix the two, the difference between them produces a single frequency that you can amplify a great deal and not have any problems because it's only a single frequency so everything in the circuit is designed strictly for that frequency and you can deal with your internal capacitance you can deal with all that and make them actually come out to help you instead of hinder you and then feed that into your detector in your audio frequency and output and uh, I've got a representation of one of those radios in fact it actually has a tuned RF um, amp before the mixer um, hope you can see that all right cause I, but basically you've got your antenna comes in and now this is a, a shortwave radio also multiband which is one thing you can do by setting your IF at one frequency it's always going to stay that same frequency no matter what your band is set at. You can be on broadcast or any one number of short waves. But the signal comes in, goes, in this case, actually will go through an RF amp that's tuned. It's got its own set of coils into the mixer. It's a mixer oscillator. Here's your oscillator coils. We also feed in, feeds out to the IF uh, transformers, to the IF amp and transformer again and detector then first audio and output now the nice thing about superheterodyne again is that you can run superheterodyne or you can run yeah there's superheterodyne you can run um, shortwave uh, it's going to have the same IF frequency all you do is you just add in however many coils for however many bands you want so you know if you want four bands you have four sets of coils for your antenna, your RF, if you've got an RF tube, and your oscillator, and put in a four band switch that can switch all of them. You know, three bands, four bands, five bands, whatever number you want. Only determination, you know, the only thing that you got to do is just make sure you've got a switch. You can switch them in and just add the coils in. Uh, the mixer tube don't care, the oscillator don't care and it just feeds through and the IF is where your main application is going to happen here and you can have more than one stage of IF you can go up to three to four stages of this and get exceptional amount of gain and the radio becomes extremely sensitive radio that can pick up very weak signals very long distance signals so but uh, that's basically all there is to it um, like I said, this is just uh, just an overview of this stuff, so um, later I'll get in depth exactly, you know, more into math and more into the actual operation of the circuits in, in detail, in extreme detail. But I wanted to, you know, this is just part of the theory lessons of kind of explaining it and where how we tune in, uh, how the how it's changed over the years and stuff. So anyway, thanks for watching, um, and uh, this will be going up tonight too. Uh, the Math 101 Part Three is being uploaded as I as I'm recording this. So look forward to both of these videos. Thank you again for watching and your comments, and I'll see you on the next one.